Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Gillard once again, and welcome to our final lecture, which will be over the cardiac examination techniques, heart sounds, and murmurs. It's a pretty long one uh, and a very important one for boards and for my final examination, so make sure you pay attention to it. And I think that's all I need to say, so let's get moving here. Go over the basics heart. Now I'm going to go over this fast because we've covered this in lab quite a bit and you've had this in physiology. So, But the S1 heart sound, of course, is the lub in lub-dub. And it's caused by the atrioventricular valves slamming shut. Who are the atrioventricular valves? Of course, they are the they're the mitral valve, or the the little symbol for that is M1, and the tricuspid valve is T2 or T1, and the mitral valve closes slightly before the tricuspid valve. Why is that? It's under a little higher pressure, right? The left side of the heart is a higher pressure system, so it closes a little bit quicker. And in some conditions like right bundle branch block, the M1 and T2 actually split. So what, what, do, what do I mean by that, they split? I mean when you auscultate uh, for, let's say, over the mitral area or the tricuspid area, you can actually hear instead of a uh, lub-dub, you'll hear a lub-lub-dub, lub-lub-dub they split. That means you can actually hear the components. Normally when the heart beats lub-dub, lub-dub, you can't hear the, because there's four valves making those sounds, right? So you can't hear uh, those sounds. They sound as one. That should of course be dub, not bub. What's the diagnosis here? Let me give you a second to look at that. Aha, okay, there's the rabbit ears, right? There's one rabbit ear, there's another. I even gave this away here. So that's the RSR prime wave. This is in lead V1. It looked pretty similar in AVR. Remember what that was? Right bundle branch block. S1 heart sound. Best heard at the apex of the heart course. Where's that? That's the mitral auscultation area. But it can be heard anywhere, uh, especially Herb's Point. That's my favorite spot. Where's Herb's Point again? Third intercostal space, left sternal border. That's a good perch to hear everything of the heart. Only the M1 and, and T1 components of S1 are normally audible, right? And normally they're together, so you can't even really hear them separately. How do you know the difference between the S1 and S2 sound? Hmm, how do you know the difference? Well, S1 is louder at the apex and at the left sternal border compared to S2. S2 is louder at the base. Where's the base of the heart again? That's up at the second intercostal space, left and right sternal border. That's where Remember the apet monkey? Or all pigs eat too much? That's the aortic and pulmonic regions. So S2 is obviously louder there. S1 coincides with the carotid artery pulse. I'll show you a technique to do that in a second. S1 coincides with the R wave. If you have a rhythm strip going, you can check, you can see it quite easily. And then the easiest way is lub dub pause. Lub dub pause. Lub dub so one comes after the long diastolic kind of pause or that long stretch of course sometimes the heart's going faster it's not quite as easy uh, but for someone who's just starting out it may sound simple but maybe it's not so simple so you should all get out your stethoscopes and listen to your heart make sure you can find that S1 sound it takes a little practice so how do you find that first that first heart sound, well, oscul, uh, herbs point, auscultate uh, herbs point with one hand, and now you're going to palpate the carotid artery with the other. 
Remember we tried to stay off the bifurcation point, which, which is about by the laryngeal prominence. Laryngeal prominence is probably up a little higher on this person. Uh, but anyway, uh, Seidel, one of the Board of Chiropractic Examiner books, allows you to palpate the carotid pulse up by the angle uh, of the mandible, or up by the ram or the um, yeah, up by the the body here, the under part, and that's a good place to get it. It's kind of hard down. Most of the other board books like you to do it down by the clavicle, but in reality it's much harder to find it down there so you're going to palpate uh, that and then you're going to auscultate just put your patient will be supine and you will put the, uh, the diaphragm right over herbs point third intercostal space left sternal border and you will sync them up because they will be a perfect match the the pulsation you feel will be synchronous with the S1 heart sound, so you can pick it out that way as well. There's an example of that. Okay, that's not obviously not on the, that's on the mitral area, so you'd want to be right about in here with your stethoscope is better, but this will work as well. Okay. Uh, intensity, there's three factors that determine, determine the intensity of the S1 sound. It's the distance separating the leaflets from the annulus. Remember, the leaflets are snug against the annulus uh, during systole. During diastole, they flop open uh, into the ventricle, so uh, blood can fill the ventricle. And there's, well, we'll see. I don't want to get ahead of myself there. But there's a distance separating the leaflets uh, from the annulus. And, Depending on that distance, uh, it, the farther that distance, the greater the sound sometimes. The mobility of the leaflets. So if the leaflets or the cusps of the valve are stenotic and sticky and they don't move very good, that's going to affect the intensity. We'll see how in a minute. And then how quickly the interventricular pressure or the contraction forces of the heart which cause the interventricular pressure rise uh, during isometric volume contraction, or in other words, during systole. So a short PR interval, let's see, S1 intensity, short P. So normally, we know this already, right, from our second. PR interval, well, let's, let me give you a second to look at this. What do you see here? Here's the P wave. QRS complex T wave. Right? Well, normally the PR interval, which occurs when? Late diastole, uh, the AV valve will drift toward a, a closed position. Okay, so it's uh, therefore you can't get up too much speed before slamming, uh, before the valves slam into the the annulus. Does that make sense? If the PR interval is short in duration, that means there's not much time between atrial systole and ventricular systole. The leaflets don't have time to drift toward the annulus, so they're way away from the annulus. So when the heart contracts, when systole occurs, they have a lot of room to, to slam uh, in. They have a lot of uh, time to build up momentum and they make a louder noise. Recall that the PR interval duration can never be less uh, than three little boxes, uh, 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds, some people like. So what's wrong? This PR interval, uh, it's only, I don't know if you can see that very good, the boxes didn't come out, but PR interval would start about here, so it's right at the beginning of this box, there's one box. So it's way too short. It's like it's a box and a half. It should be, uh, it should be three boxes. So it's way too short. So the more open the valves are, they have a, get, a greater time to gain speed and momentum at the start of systole. So, or you could say there's a greater slamming distance. That's kind of my word, but I, I like that idea. Uh, the greater slam, the greater the slamming distance. Uh, the greater the force that the valves will hit the uh, the annulus. And I should back up. What the heck is the annulus? 
Remember, that's the circle uh, between, uh, that's the hole in the fibrous skeleton that is in between the atria and the ventricles. And that's, that's kind of the platform what the valve, what the cusps are attached to. All right, so if there's a normal three sec or three uh, little boxes during that time, the valves will naturally start to drift toward the annulus before systole occurs. So if they, let's say they drift halfway toward the annulus and now the, the ventricles contract, those valves will slam into the annulus, but it won't be with that much force. Uh, compared to if there's a short PR interval, they're all the way open, so there's a longer run at those uh, at the annulus. So it'll, they'll hit the annulus with more fo force, and they'll generate a louder S1 sound. So S1 intensity, short PR interval syndromes. Uh, you already know two of the pre-excitation syndromes. We've talked about those before that are associated with a short PR interval. What are they or who are they? Remember those? Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Laungenon-Levine syndrome. So go back and review those if you are a little foggy. Those are definitely, those are nice board things there. So therefore, both of these conditions are associated with an accentuated or loud S1 heart sound. And that's from Lily. That's one of our, uh, is that required? That should be required book if it's not. Okay, mild mitral valve stenosis is also associated with a too loud S1. The lub is lub dub, lub dub, it's too loud. So mild, mild stenosis. Why, how, do this, how does that work? What's the mechanism behind that? Well, because the leaflets are stiff uh, and less mobile, that natural drift toward the annuli that negates some of that slamming noise uh, is eliminated. They're stiff and sticky. They don't want to move. So you get a bigger slamming distance again. So therefore, when systole begins, there's a longer slamming distance. Just said that. So greater slamming distance gives the leaflets, again, more time to build up speed before they hit the annulus of their respected, of their respected chamber, which makes a louder sound. Diminished S1 heart sound. Okay, so what can diminish it? Well, if a short PR interval made it too loud, then an increased PR interval uh, will also decrease the sound. Uh, it'll it'll decrease the center also. Oh, I see what I'm saying. So an increased PR interval also decreases uh, the S1 heart sound. So recall that the PR interval should be no longer than uh, 0 0.20 seconds, which is five boxes. Remember the you times by four to get these boxes. One box is 0 0.04, so that would be. 0 0.04 times 5 is one big box. Now, how does this work now if it's too, too you could probably figure this out. If it's, how does this, uh, this kind of work out? Well, if there's a delay between atrial systole and ventricular systole, the AV valves uh, will have more time to drift into the closed position. Let me check something real quick. Yep. So they'll have more time uh, to drift into the closed position. In other words, in our example before, we said our slamming distance was about 50%, and that's just you know for for understanding this. If the PR interval is too short, the slamming distance will be 100%. They don't have that natural drift during late diastole. But if the PR interval is really long, they have plenty of time to drift almost into a closed position. And so when syst systole occurs and the uh, ventricular pressure rises, these valves slam shut, but they don't have very far to slam, so the noise will be reduced. What's going on here? How's that PR R interval? Never should be more than one big box, right? That's almost two boxes, so that's a prolonged PR interval for sure. 
everything I said right here. Slamming distance will be diminished. Okay, I just said that. Other causes of a diminished S1 heart sound include a mitral valve regurgitation. So the leaflets don't properly seal, so they don't slam into the annulus correctly. And so just by default, they don't make much noise, period, because they're already leaking blood during systole. Severe mitral stenosis. Uh, the leaflets are basically frozen and barely close at all. They're, therefore, there's not much slamming force and there won't be much noise. Other causes of a diminished S1 heart sound, left ventricular hypertrophy. So the, the injection of blood into the atrial, uh, during atrial systole into a stiff kind of muscle-bound ventricle results in a much higher than normal left ventricular pressure. So under the influence of higher than normal ventricular pressure, the leaflet drifting speed uh, just before ventricular systole is greatly enhanced. If there's a lot of pressure in the ventricle, that natural drift is going to be sped up. So again, the slamming, even if the PR interval is normal, because of that inherently high pressure in the left ventricle, and the right ventricle too, all the same goes for that. But that slamming distance is decreased. It's all about that slamming distance. So by the time systole occurs, there's not much slamming distance left. Heart sound is louder. All right, moving on to the S2 heart sound. What is that made from? Well, that's the semilunar valves. Who are the semilunar valves? The aortic and pulmonary valve or pulmonic valve, either one is fine. Those are the semilunar valves. So that's made uh, when after systole is done, the heart takes a little nap, a little rest, and because of the elastic recoil of the uh, large arteries, the blood goes, well not only keeps moving uh, anti-grade uh, through the system, which is a good thing, right? That's why the blood does never stops moving. It also goes uh, ant antigrade or goes backwards and that backwards flow of blood slams shut the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve and that's the dub lub dub lub dub and let's see so it's created by the aortic closure a they have names just like m1 and t and t1 these are a2 for the aortic valve P2 for the pulmonic valve. And normally A2 closes a little tiny bit before P2. Why would that be? Again, it's under higher pressure. It's best heard, of course, at the base of the heart or at Herb's point is a good perch to hear both the uh, both S2 heart sounds is a great place. If you want to zero in, you can go over the aortic valve or aortic auscultation area, which is the right sternal border, second intercostal space. Pulmonic valve, of course, is the left sternal border, second intercostal space. S2 is always louder at the base compared to S1, right? Because you're right over the top of the, are you over the top of the valves actually? No, that's not exactly where the valves are, but that's where they project the most sound. Here's a cartoon. So there's the apex of the heart. Who, What sound would be louder at the apex naturally? That would be the S1. So this is trying to show lub, dub, lub, dub. If you go to the base of the heart, you have lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. All right, normal, and here's a link. Now, this is the only bummer we're not in class, uh, but you can pause the video and check out this link. I won't click it now, it'll mess everything up. But you can go hear what a nice normal heart sounds like. Splitting, okay, now we're gonna get, now we talked about this in lab too, so you should have a good idea. Physiological splitting, pretty difficult to hear right in a noisy lab, but especially without a cardiac stethoscope. Uh, but you can hear it if you're in a quiet office, especially if you have a cardiac stethoscope. You can hear it in most people. But unlike the S1 sound, which is fixed, what's that word mean, fixed? 
it doesn't split normally. Uh, during respiration, the X2 sound actually splits into A2 and P2. And that's called a physiological splitting. A great board question, great my test question, that you just need to know that. And specifically, what is it? I explained it in lab. It'll be on your lab and the the lab final and the now that I'm doing this, it's on it's fair game for the lecture final as well. Uh, but we said that when you take a deep breath in, you create a negative interthoracic pressure, and it's like think of it as a vacuum cleaner. It's sucking blood into the right side of the heart. Remember from lab, from Gross Lab, it's all squishy. The right ventricle is very pliable, uh, and it has a lot of stretchability, uh, so it can fill up with blood. So when you take a deep breath in, and blood gets sucked into the uh, the right side of the heart. Now you have a longer train of blood moving through the right side of the heart. So because it's a longer train, the pulmonic valve has to wait. It can't close quite as quickly as normal because it's got a longer train of blood moving through it. And on the other side of the coin, the lungs actually hold blood. They 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 hold blood from going back to the left side of the heart. Uh, so you have a short train of blood moving through the left side of the heart at peak inspiration. And therefore if it's a short, because of Starling's law, whatever's in the ventricle is going to be it's going to be pumped. And so you have a short train of blood moving, moving through the left side which will close the aortic valve a hair earlier. So because of those two phenomena, you get a lub da dub lub da dub lub da dub lub da dub And remember, it's a very subtle, we played these recordings in lab, it's a very quick lub da dub It almost sounds like one sound sometimes, so you have to practice and listen to that sound. But that's a physiological splitting, and it should only do that during what? During inspiration. All right, so that's everything I just said right there. You can review that at your leisure. Still talking about the gulp of blood, same thing as a train of blood. Talked about boxcars in lab. Okay, so Jarvis, which is our class text, which isn't the swiftest in this section, I should say. There's quite a few. Uh, it's it's just not a cardiology book, but. Uh, I did. It took me a long time, by the way, to make this lecture. I must have, I probably used, I would say, at least five different texts to piece this story together, uh, confirming you know, three, three out of the five texts would have to confirm a certain area before I actually put it in there. So this is a pretty accurate presentation. Anyway, Jarvis says that physiological splitting occurs on every fourth heartbeat at a normal heart rate. So, and remember, A2 is the first, followed by P2. And physiological splitting is best heard over the pulmonic valve. Why would it be heard best over the pulmonic valve? Because I thought, didn't we say that the aortic valve closes first? Why would you want to go over the pulmonic valve? Hmm. Uh, well, it's because the aortic valve is loud to begin with because of the high pressure. It's a high pressure system. The pulmonic valve is kind of, there's not a lot of power over there. Uh, so if you put your stethoscope over the pulmonic valve, it kind of equalizes uh, the sounds out. It'll kind of give, it a, give a boost to that uh, pulmonic valve area. So that's why that is done. Physiological split, there's a real recording, you can go check that out. But here again, here's a cartoon of it. It's lub dub lub dub lub dub and these are really close. And you'll see why I'm making them so close in a second. Alright, so here's the patient breathing in. Lub dub lub dub lub dub He gets to maximum inspiration. Lub dub lub dub lub dub all right, accentuated as two heart sounds. 
So if the pressure within the ascending aorta is increased, let's say you have systemic hypertension, then the reverse flow of the blood, or the retrograde flow, did I mess that up? I think I messed that up before. Got Retrograde means going normal downstream. Anterior grade means going back. Now I think I got it right. But if I didn't, let's straighten that out. Retrograde is downstream. Antigrade is... No, I still got it messed up. The reverse is retrograde blood flow. So that's going upstream. Antigrade is going downstream as normal. Uh, but then, let's see, so let's see, then the reverse flow of blood uh, at the beginning of systole has a greater magnitude. Therefore, it slams into the aortic valves with a greater force because the uh, the great vessels are under higher pressure because of the hypertension. Does that make sense? Okay, so that would accentuate the S2 sounds because there's more force. It's more than just that uh, that that elastic. Remember, we said that elastic recoil slams the S2 or makes the S2 sound. Uh, but now it's going to uh, have another force because of high pressure. It's going to slam even harder pulmonary tension, hypertension, would have the same effect on the pulmonic valve. So not only systemic hypertension, but also pulmonary hypertension, which we'll be talking more about probably on Tuesday, has the same effect on the pulmonic valve. It makes an accentuated S2 heart sound. So if either, now a diminished S2 heart sound, what makes the, the lub up, really quiet and wimpy. If either the semilunar valves become severely stenotic, uh, then they lose their ability to slam shut and make noise. Uh, so, for example, if a patient has severe aortic stenosis, then the S2 sound will only be made by the majority of the sound will come from the wimpy pulmonic valve, so it'll be decreased. Now, an expiratory or regular S2 sound will be uh, diminished or soft in this situation. And the inspiratory S2 sound will not have a split. What? I thought we just said when you take a deep breath, there's a split between A2 and P2. What's the deal with that? Well, if, if the aortic valve is sticky and doesn't want to split early, it eliminates that, S, that inspiratory split. So therefore, S2 will be quiet even when you're auscultating over the base of the tart, even when you're uh, inspiring or when you're taking a deep breath in, you lose the physiological split. So S2 pathological splitting, you should never hear S2 splitting in the respiratory cycle. Or, I'm sorry, in the expiratory cycle. What does that mean? Well, we said normally S2 will split during inspiration, but it should never split uh, during during expiration. If you do, there's some type of heart pathology present. So let's talk about some of these pathological S2 splitting. Uh, and these are again are good board questions and good my questions. And I don't think, did we talk about this in the lab? I don't think we did. So this is more for the lecture final. So we have fixed splitting, we have wide splitting, and paradoxical splitting. Let's talk about fixed splitting. So as the name implies, there is no splitting between uh, between during the S2 sound. A2 and P2 are fixed, which would be normal during inspiration. That's okay, but not during expiration. So let's see. So diagnose when the S2 splitting occurs during inspiration and expiration. So they must be the same duration. So in other words, A2 and P2 are split all of the time. And it will be heard anywhere in the precordium, not just in the pulmonic area. What are some causes for fixed splitting? An atrial septal defect, an ASD, can cause it. In fact, according to our text, Lily, it's the most common cause of fixed splitting. So put that one in your memory banks. Specifically, the sagunum type of ASD is the most common. We don't need to know that. 
uh, because of the left to right shunt the right side uh, of the heart is overfilled which negates that inspiratory uh, inspiratory effect so there's always in other words there's always a big gulp of blood or a big train of blood passing through the right side so you'll get the normal split you would think that maybe there would be more but it's already maxed out so the dis the the right when you take a deep breath in you're already maxed out from the blood coming over from the left side so you can't get any more blood you can't any add any more box cars on your train but on the other hand when you're blowing air out and expiring you still have plenty of box cars coming in all right Let's see some more causes. Severe right, uh, right ventricular failure. So the right ventricle just can't handle the increase uh, in volume. Uh, so it just keeps a constant, does the best it can. It can't, it can't uh, accommodate that extra blood even though it, it tries. Pulmonary stenosis can do it if the valve is closing late because it's stiff. So uh, let's see. Let's explain that one a little more. So if the pulmonary pulmonic valve is stiff, so you take a deep breath in, it's going to be late anyway, whether there's blood going through it or not. And when you blow the air out, it's still going to be late because the valve is old and stiff and it just doesn't, it just closes behind the aortic valve and it's not really related to the blood coming in. And a ventricular septal defect is the same mechanism as the atrial septal defect. You get a right to left shunt, so it's always got a huge gulp of blood in the right side. Uh, nice, that Stanford 25 site. Uh, it's got some real nice uh, videos. So you can learn more about it. Paradoxical splitting. So as the name applies, it's a reverse from what is normal. Occurs when the S2 heart sound paradoxically splits during expiration but not inspiration so it's just the reverse of what's normal so specifically with inspiration a2 and p2 are synchronized and the heart sounds as one however with expiration p2 comes before a2 so if the degree of aortic valve slowness is not too bad, you may still have a split in inspiration. So you could have a double split, uh, but it'll be much more narrow and you would probably never be able to hear it. So that's just a little caveat to that. But for our purposes, it's a complete split. So there is, this is basically heard as one. So it's when you, it's a lub, dub. But when you're expiring, it's a lub da da lub da da uh, Pathophysiology, why does this occur? Uh, because there's an abnormal delay in the closure of the aortic valve. So during inspiration, the normal inspiratory delay of the P2 valve is matched by a slow to close A2 valve. Right? So the the A2 valve is sticky, it's not closing enough. But during expiration, that slow to close aortic valve, it's now delayed compared to the normally closing pulmonic valve. So you get a reverse split. So it's all about that darn aortic valve not it's being sticky. It's probably stenotic and not uh, functioning correctly. And there's some other causes here as well. Uh, let's see. So in adults, the most common cause for test purposes is a left bundle branch block. Recall the left BBB results in an impaired electrical conduction down the left side of the heart, which would delay the contraction of the left ventricle. It's not getting the signal in time. And that would, de that would delay the close of the aortic valve. So left bundle branch block is a good one. That's definitely going to be on the final. See, I underlined it. So when you see stuff like that, or when you see stars, I don't think I put a lot of stars in this one, but that's stuff to put in your memory banks now, not a day or two before the test. Oh, there's my aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis, it's just a sticky, slow-to-close aortic valve which negates the effects of that physiological uh, splitting. 
Okay, others can call uh, others uh, that can cause this paradoxical splitting are is the WPW syndrome, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and uh, just left ventricular dysfunction in general. Okay, what about a wide splitting? AKA would be a widened splitting or persistent splitting. It's like a uh, like fixed splitting, S2 splitting is heard in both inspiration and expiration. Well, what's the difference then? But unlike fixed splitting, the splitting is significantly wide during inspiration. Why would that be? It's because the pulmonic valve uh, is already closing slow compared to the pulmonic valve. Let's see, that doesn't make sense. Uh, unlike fixed splitting, let's see, where am I at here? Oh, it's because the pulmonic valve is really closing slow compared to the, shouldn't it be the aortic valve? Yeah, that's right. Let's look at a picture here. So, there's a wide sp splitting, and it's really wide with inspiration. That extra, that extra gulp of blood uh, makes it even slower. But on expiration, it's still split. So let's look at the causes for that. So now it's almost like the the last one. Uh, only now there's something wrong, obviously, with the right side of the heart or the pulmonic valve. So uh, typically occurs secondary to right bundle branch block. So that will delay. Uh, the current getting into the left uh, side of the heart, the left ventricle, and it delays left ventricular contraction, so you're going to get a slower close of the pulmonary uh, valve period. Now, if you have, uh, just like aortic, just like uh, aortic stenosis, if you have pulmonary stenosis, it can also cause a wide split because it makes the pulmonary valve slow to close anyway. All right, switching gears, extrasystolic sounds. The S3 heart sound, we talked about this in lab, so this will be a review for you. Recall that there are two components to ventricular filling. There's an early diastolic and a late diastolic. And I should have put in here an early ventricular diastolic and a late ventricular diastolic. And this is a more passive uh, filling phase. And the late diastolic filling of the ventricles is really based on atrial systole, right? The atria has a diastole and systole in and of itself. So the S3 heart sound is generated early uh, during the early diastole, uh, diastolic phase of filling. Uh, and it follows the opening of the ventricles. It corresponds to the ventricular rapid filling phase and then it stops suddenly once that ventricle uh, hits a certain point. And uh, that's, it's still quite controversial about what actually makes the sound. So in order to hear the S3 heart sound, the patient has to be supine, right? You cannot have the patient standing or even in the seated position. Remember I said in lab, S3 and S4 heart sounds are, you have to be supine and even better, they have to be in the left lateral decubitus position, which will push uh, the heart closer to the chest wall. Uh, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Left-sided left -sided S3 heart sound is best accentuated or best auscultated with the bell. So that means it's a high pitch or low pitch sound. I gave some of you my na analogy for the word bell, uh, but it's a low pitch sound. Uh, at the mitral valve, uh, so you want to go over the mitral valve area, the apex of the heart, with a patient either supine but preferably in the left lateral decubitus position, really accentuates it. Now a right-sided S3 sound would be best auscultated again with the bell, but this time it would be at the left lower sternal border, i.e. the tricuspid area, which makes sense because that's where the tricuspid valve projects its sound. So in this phase, the building arterial blood pressure blows open uh, the aortic valves, because remember they're closed because systole is just completed, but the aortic, like the palm, the aort, uh, atrioventricular valves are still closed. 
like the mitral and tricuspid valve. So during this phase, this early diastolic phase, the valves open up because pressure is greater in the atria at this point. And then the blood comes rushing in uh, to the nearly empty ventricle. It still has some volume in there. But that incoming blood creates vibrations of something. Authors can't agree on what it is. But the incoming blood vibrates uh, the valves, the chordae tendinae. What are the chordae tendinae? Those are the little parachute cords that, that support the valves, let, allow the valves to close just right on the annulus, and the ventricle walls themselves. Uh, Lily says it appears to be coming from the tensing and vibration of the chordae, temine, uh, chordae temp, uh, uh, tendinae. So that's what we'll go with. Uh, the sound is dull and low pitched where we said that so it's best heard with the bell and here's the classic uh, the cadence how does the rhythm of an s3 sound that's the classic uh, kentucky which never made a lot of sense to me uh, but it sounds like kentucky so it's kentucky 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 other ways are long short short long short short long short short or freak I'm screwed freak I'm screwed freak I'm screwed that's a popular one and you can fill in the, the most mnemonics on the web use a expletive for that so whatever works for you use it uh, but you gotta know uh, the, the cadence how what a cadence is of the S3 heart sound that'll be on the test okay so how do you tell the difference between an S3 heart sound and an S2 heart sound? Remember the S2 heart sound was lub da dub, lub da dub, lub da dub. It was a similar. Well, for one, it's the location. The S3 is at the apex or left lower sternal border, uh, while the S2 is at the base of the heart. That's one thing. Uh, respiratory change. Uh, the S3 does not split which is going to be kind of hard for us to hear. But again, if you had a cardiac stethoscope in a quiet room, you can hear these things. Uh, the S3 does not vary in timing or width of respiration, so it doesn't split. Respira inspiration has no effect on it. Is that it? That's it. Uh, and, you know, I should have added, I should have added another one here. It's closer together. Uh, the physiological splitting is lup Lub da dub. It's so close you can't hear it. But the S3 is lub da dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub. You can you can hear uh, that sound. So S3 sound is it dangerous? Is what the heck is it? Uh, it's typically a normal heart sound in people under the age of 40. And we had three Jarvis Mayo Clinic cardiology and Lily all agree on that. Uh, it's normal in people under 40 for the most part. Occasionally, you could hear it in a woman over 40 years old, and it's also, according to Cleveland Clinic Cardiology, it's common in the third trimester of pregnancy. For As a chiropractor, if you hear this sound, though, I mean, we're not cardiologists, you're not going to hear this very often. So for our purposes, I would still make a referral uh, at least to the uh, patient's primary care physician to further work this up, if not directly to a cardiologist, just to be safe. Pathological S3, so if you're over 40 and hear this, it's not a good thing, right? So there's some AKAs. It's no longer a S3 heart sound. Uh, so when it's when you're under 40, you just call it an S3 heart sound or a physiological S3. But when you're over 40, now you have a pathological S3 heart sound. The big AKA is a ventricular gallop, which Lily uses, and an S3 gallop, which Jarvis loses. There's some other ones, an early diastolic gallop, post-systolic gallop, which is Bates, another board book. So, But I think we're safe calling it either an S3 uh, one of these three sounds here, ventricular gallop, seems to be probably the the best one. That's how I always that's how I learned it. Indicates severe left ventricular dysfunction, so that's not a good f thing. In fact, uh, from a number of 
uh, conditions uh, from a number of conditions can cause left ventricular failure including early heart failure uh, with left ventricular dilation we'll talk about that here in a little bit it's associated with mitral regurgitation so this what this means is if you have severe left dis if you have if your left ventricle is not working you often have sequelae associated with that and it's all you're already in early heart failure if your left ventricle is is big and not working great but it's often associated with a mitral regurgitation the valves get pulled apart because the heart is so big a ventricular septal defect is a different that's not a sequelae you're born with that one or patent ductus arteriosus but these could also uh, contribute to a severe left ventricular dysfunction also may indicate a right ventricular failure with severe tricuspid valve so that's another one so we have a left ventricular dysfunction uh, with a left ventricular dilation these two should go together but they do often go together although we'll talk about the difference between hypertrophy and dilation later and it also could indicate number two would be a right ventricular failure with severe tricuspid regurgitation and it might be the earliest sign of heart failure which goes back to this number one here dilated cardiomyopathy we're going to talk about non-cardiac related s3 heart sound so Jarvis says the other non-cardiac conditions can exacerbate or intensify the s3 heart sound so they don't in in and of themselves they're not going to cause this condition but they can bring it out uh, just simple exercise anything that uh, well the, these are the out the, the high cardiac output conditions which speed the blood hyperthyroidism anemia pregnancy wet berry berry fever anxiety can do it but that's Jarvis and I could not get that confirmed in any of uh, the major texts but I think this is just so rudimentary uh, that I this is a correct statement but it doesn't the point is this these conditions don't cause the s3 heart sound they don't damage the heart they just accentuate it you can hear some real recordings of an s3 here we played some of these in lab s4 heart sound now this is not uh, as good as an s this is more serious than having an s3 typically it results when the ventricular filling remember ventricular filling again I'm repeating this again uh, it, this one has to do with late ventricular diastole or atrial systole so the S4 heart sound is generated during the late diastolic uh, when the atria start to contract the sound arises when the left or right atrium contraction occurs and in bottom line it, it is after the atria contract it injects blood into a stiff and non-compliant ventricle the ventricle is stiff uh, it doesn't work good it's pathological and that stiffness is thought to cause a vibration uh, maybe valve related tissue maybe the ventricle wall itself again they're not 100 percent sure what the heck causes it uh, but it's often associated with a stiff and non-compliant ventricle which is pathological and the condition usually indicates heart disease and the ventricular non-compliance is secondary to now here's all, some of the theories uh, Lily says it's myocardial ischemia so you have coronary arterial disease where the uh, myocardium is just chronically without uh, you know some of the myos myocytes have died off and it's getting tough uh, Lily also says ventricular hypertrophy uh, which could be to what could cause ventricular hypertrophy anything that makes the the ventricles have to work harder than they're designed to work for many years like hypertension aortic stenosis can do it from Jarvis coronary artery disease which actually relates back to myocardial ischemia so I can buy that one from Jarvis and cardiomyopathy a pathological s4 sound is called an atrial gallop so Lillian Jarvis agree on this there's some AKA's an s4 gallop pre-systolic gallop because it occurs so close to s1 
but an atrial gallop. So we have a ventricular gallop for S3 and an atrial gallop for S4. Uh, let's see. So when heard, always suspect pathology from Cleveland Clinic. Physiological S4 does occasionally occur, uh, but it's in infants and small children. Uh, well-trained athletes could occasionally occur, and occasionally just in people over 40. But for our purposes, it's always pathological. This is also from uh, Lizo or Lizo, which is boy, it, it, a well-intended book. But boy, I, I actually bought it and returned it. It's just filled with errors. So I kind of take it things with a grain of salt. But Bates is a board book, so now this couldn't be confirmed in any of Lilly or. Cleveland Clinic cardiology or Mayo Clinic cardiology. So let's let's when we hear it, it's pathological. Always suspect pathology. I probably shouldn't even put that in there, but auscultation of an S4. So it's a dull. So if it's dull, it's going to be heard with the with the bell. A low pitch sound best heard with the bell. Need a quality. Remember on the bell, do you push hard or light with the bell? You have to push very lightly to get the bell to work. What happens if you push hard? It stretches the skin and it acts it acts just like uh, just like a diaphragm. It completely negates the effect. So you have to have a light touch with the bell. The diaphragm doesn't matter. Anyway, I digress. Uh, best heard with the bell at the apex of the heart. While the patient is again in the left lateral decubus position, or at least very least supine, I mean some older people you can't get them in that position. This technique is for left-sided S4 heart sounds. Uh, it can occur on the right side. You can get a right-sided S4 heart sound, so you would auscultate the left lower sternum border or the tricuspid region for that. And let's see. Uh, so if present shows up immediately before the S1 heart sound, hence the pre-systolic gallop, AKA. Right-sided S4 heart sounds are rare, but if they occur, you will hear them, I just said that, left lower sternal border, and they could actually increase with inspiration. Now the cadence, push her to put a star on this one, Cadence is now, we had Kentucky for S3, Tennessee, S, and notice Kentucky K comes before Tennessee. That's how I remember Kentucky and Tennessee. The classic, even when I was in school back in the dark ages, the Tennessee was always the cadence for an S4. Uh, so it sounds like Tennessee, 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 or sometimes it's Tennessee, Tennessee, that's how it is. Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Right? Or you can say short, short, long, short, short, long. Or well, freak you, well, freak you. Okay, definitely take the time to go to some of these uh, sites and listen to these uh, with your own ears. It does take a bit to get these. Uh, to get these kind of embedded in your brain. A quadruple rhythm with a summation gallop. It's a rare finding, but it's in Lily. You need to know it. A quadruple rhythm, it's a heart sound that occurs when the patient has an S3 and an S4, which combine with the S1 and S2. So you can check out the sound there. There's a summation gallop. If the patient has a quadruple rhythm and develops tachycardia, a fast heart, uh, then the heart sounds change into a summation gallop. Uh-oh. Now those of you who happen to be in class know what that means. We're going to fall down a little rabbit hole because I need to talk about the most common cardiomyopathy. So that's Alice. We're falling down a rabbit hole, so hang on. Cardiomyopathy. That's a parent category which has several children underneath it. 
uh, and it's they all of them are muscle disease of the heart of the myocardium specifically and these disorders may cause mechanical or electrical dis and or electrical dysfunction of the myocardia they could kill you they're fairly rare uh, but they do they do happen uh, it excludes heart muscle dysfunction secondary to cardiovascular disorders so hypertension valve problems valvular disease congenital heart disease doesn't include those these are just something has gone wrong with the actual myocardial muscle of the heart sorry about that a little drink of water uh, often results in an inappropriate ventricular hypertrophy or a dilation which in turn commonly leads to a slow progressive heart failure in death the heart can compensate at first but after a couple decades of compensating the heart you basically wreck your heart there are three main types of cardiomyopathy which are based on the anatomical appearance of the heart and the function of the left ventricle. Let's meet the players. We're actually only going to talk about the most common, which is dilated cardiomyopathy. There's also a hypertrophic, remember hypertrophic or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a restrictive cardiomyopathy, which are even rarer. But the dilated, remember that means that the myocardium is not muscle bound. Like, hyper, like a hypertrophic uh, ventricle is. It's just dilated, which is kind of strange. Dilated, stretched out, it's not a good thing. So let's talk, DCM, let's talk about dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, it's among the most common causes of heart failure. And it's the most common type of cardiomyopathy. So it's the bad one. Based on an autopsy study, you can see the prevalence is quite rare. It's it's 0.005% of the population. So about 12,000 people in the United States die from this condition. Now, what's the prevalence of people walking around with it uh, who don't know it? Uh, that's a different story. Uh, we don't know for sure. So anyway, you can see that uh, it's, it's pretty rare. But the people walking around with it who have not become symptomatic yet, it's definitely probably at least twice, if not more, as the baby boomers. This number will positively go up as the baby boomers continue to age. The hallmark of dilated cardiomyopathy is ventricular dilation with diminished contractile function. So the heart loses its, its ability to pump blood. It's usually both, ventric, both ventricles are usually affected. Sometimes it's only left, but rarely the right alone. But it usually affects both uh, ventricles because myocardium is myocardium, and this is the disease of the myocardium. So what is it? That the myocytes of the myocardium become damaged and destroyed, uh, which causes a heart dilation. And we'll explain that more in a minute. And it's not a hypertrophic condition. This is not the, it's not the heart is working harder and the muscles are beefing up. It's a disease of the myocytes. Myocytes are killed. Now here's a picture of this condition, not the greatest in the world, but this is a normal heart here. Right? So this is the remember it's the donut. Remember from our anatomy section, that's the left ventricle, right? There's the right ventricle. Now dilated cardiomyopathy, look at the, the thickness of the ventricle. It's, a, it's, it's definitely not thicker than the normal. If anything, it's smaller, but look at the size. This heart is all stretched out. Still got the same muscle. I mean, it looks to me like it's even less in this one, uh, but it's dilated and so physiologically that's going to cause a bunch of sequelae which we are going to talk about so dilated cardiomyopathy classifications so it secondary to a wide spectrum of disease which can be generally classified into six categories there's a genetic cause of this 
there's an inflammatory cause we're going to talk about there's a toxic cause we'll talk about metabolic cause neuromuscular cause idiopathic cause so let's take a look at some of these the myocardium of a normal heart is damaged via these disorders a viral condition sometimes bacterial but usually some type of virus uh, gets in there and kills and we'll talk about that more in a second it ends up destroying some of the myocardial cells connective tissue disease pregnancy sarcoidosis let's look at acute viral myocarditis now acute viral myocarditis it's as the name implies it's an inflammation of the myocardial cells now it doesn't mean you have DCM yet right you some people will get it here in a second uh, but this can recover in most people let's not get them ahead of myself here uh, generally it affects the young and previously healthy people a typical culprit includes the uh, Coxsackie virus group B of them a parvovirus B19 and adenoviruses plus there's some more less common offenders but uh, Coxsackie virus you should know that it's a cause uh, and parvo B19 is a cause so at least B19 and Coxsackie group B uh, these are the scary ones if someone you know or one of your patients has worked up and they come back with a Coxsackie B positive culture or Parvo B19 culture this is a little bit scary uh, because they have a viral myocarditis which potentially could turn into a dilated cardiomyopathy it's not it's not there yet this is the precursor of a DCM Okay, so viral myocarditis, obviously it's an inflammation of the myocardium secondary to the viral infection, and it's usually self-limiting and you'll get a full recovery. However, sometimes not. So for unre no, reasons unknown, some patients with this viral myocarditis, uh, it'll progress, it'll kill the myocardial cells, which will progress into the dilated, the DCM, the dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's hypothesized now. We don't know for sure again, but the main hypothesis is that some of the viral byproducts, whether it be you know just some product of metabolism or just the way the the virus has modified the cardiac cell, it triggers an autoimmune response, which so our own our own uh, antibodies attack and destroy the myocardium. The only pro problem, most of the components of this hypothesis fit, but the only problem is if that was true, if you take immunosuppressive drugs to kind of calm down your own immune system, they don't help. So they don't help the prognosis of the condition at all. So there's, that's why it's still, we're not exactly sure what's going on. Uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy is a form of inflammatory uh, DCM that presents with heart failure and this one strikes in the last month of pregnancy or up to six months postpartum or after pregnancy so kind of a scary one uh, risk factors patients who are older in age african-american uh, people are more affected and a history of multiple pregnancies and again, the ideology remains elusive. And 50% of the women will recover from this one, but 50% 50, 50 won't. So it's kind of a scary diagnosis. Alcohol-induced DCM. So a small portion of the DCM patients, the cause was alcohol. And you get a toxic dilated cardiomyopathy secondary to chronic and excessive consumption of alcoholic beverages again we don't know what the pathophysiology is of this but it's believed to be secondary to mitochondrial damage of the mitochondria so something in the alcohol some breakdown product we don't know what it is something is wrecking the myocardial cells specifically it's wrecking uh, it's destroying the, myocar the mitochondria within those cells and you can look this up Google if you want to know more about it it, it goes down to show exactly how what part of the mitochondria is broken but that's plenty deep for us 
so as myocardial cells are destroyed so what's the pathophysiology how does this this dilated cardiomyopathy work so as the myocardial cells are destroyed the ventricles lose their ability to eject blood so you get a loss of stroke volume uh, now initially the heart will compensate just fine you won't even know you have this by increasing the stroke volume. How does it do that? Via Frank Starling's law and by increasing the heart rate. Remember the stretch, we'll talk about this in a second, but the stretch of the heart will stimulate sympathetics to contract to speed up the heart rate. So bottom line is you're going to get an overstretching of the heart and you're going to get an increase in heart rate to compensate for this poor ability to pump blood, which will work for a while. Uh, but the heart will eventually fail. Uh, may take a decade, may take four decades, but the heart will eventually fail. It can't last forever. All right, hang on now. This is we're getting a little deeper. This is a, you know, this is cardiovascular pulmonary pathology. So we have to talk a little pathology, right? So the slow, steady loss of myocardium pumping power leads to this sequelae. So the myocardial cells get wrecked. Uh, they, you don't have as many myocardial cells. Your heart just doesn't pump as hard. And here's what's going to happen. So you get a decrease in stroke volume. Okay, we know what that is. That's the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart. That's going to lead to an increase in diastolic volume and pressure. An increase in diastolic. What the heck is that? That's the blood that's left over. Uh, that's still, so the heart can't get the it can't pump as much maybe normally the heart pumps 75 percent of the blood out during systole now it can only pump 50 percent so you got another 25 percent hanging around where it's not supposed to be that's going to in chronically increase the pressure with inside that left a ventricle okay let's see i think i said all that so the good thing is you get a normal stroke volume uh, because that extra blood that's hanging around inside the ventricle is going to be met with new fresh blood coming into the ventricle from the atria. So you're going to have a bigger uh, volume of diastolic blood now. Uh, that's going to stretch the heart out. Uh, but remember Frank Starling's law, as you stretch out that muscle, it gives it more power to contract. And then that stretch is also going to stimulate the sympathetic fibers to increase the rate. So this is how you're going to uh, combat the decrease of functional myocytes in the heart. But now you've got a vicious cycle because as the disease continues more and more, maybe more and more myo uh, myocardial cells are going to be destroyed. Uh, so that stretch is going to get greater and greater. And maybe if it was just a viral infection and that's passed, maybe it won't get a progressive uh, destruction of more and more myocardial cells, but the damage has been done. And so that stretch of the heart, the heart can't take that. It can't take this ramped up workload and it'll eventually start to fail just in and of itself. Uh, in in stage sequelae, because of the chronically high left ventricular filling pressure, blood starts to back up into the lungs. Oh, we're starting to lead in the lungs now. All right, that makes sense. So, you know, after a couple decades, the heart can't handle it. It's starting to wear out. So, got all this blood. We already have some. The blood's not emptying from the left ventricle now. It just can't hold anymore, and it's going to start backing up into the left atrium. Then it's going to back up into the pulmonary arteries. It's going to back up into the lungs now. So if it backs up into the lungs, it's going to overpressurize the capillaries. Uh, and you're going to start to leak blood and, and fluid into the interstitium. In other words, you're going to, you're going to get pul what's called pulmonary congestion. Capillaries uh, leak into the alveoli, which results in dyspnea. It's trouble breathing from hypoxia. It's going to decrease the uh, the oxygen content as well. Make sure you know this word, orthopnea. Orthopnea. So that's laying down. So these patients, they can't sleep flat anymore. They have to sleep uh, at an incline. Otherwise, that fluid will kind of uh, go up into the upper bronchial tree and they'll start choking. Uh, and let's see. And also on examination, you're going to hear 
crackles, sometimes called rails. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but specifically, you can auscultate uh, these little crack, snap, crackle, pop, like Velcro pulling apart. So these are all signs in stages uh, of this disorder. So the backup of the heart will, here's another thing it causes. It's going to cause right-sided, uh, it's going to affect the right side of the heart. Because now the blood is backed up into the lungs. Now the right side of the heart is going to have trouble pumping in, pumping its blood into that, that, that mess in the lungs. So the right side's not built for power, so it can fail quite easily. It's going to get hypertrophied from working too hard. It's going to become congested and uh, you'll have trouble from this as well. If you have a paid, uh, a probe patent for aminal volley, uh, this is going to increase the pressure inside the right uh, ventricles and atria. You'll blow open that paid, uh, probe patent for aminal volley in, in this situation. And the black up is going to continue. So now it's affected the left side of the heart. Now it's affected the lungs. Now it's the backup has affected the right side of the heart and now it's going to go into the systemic circulation so you're going to get you're going to get uh, superior vena cava is going to back up all the way into the jugular vein so you'll see jugular vein distension it'll back up inferior vena cava uh, into the into the liver and so the liver will start to get large become enlarged and then the liver uh, the blood will back up out of that and you'll get swelling, you'll get ascites, uh, an effusion ascites, you'll get caput medusa which we talked about, esophageal varicosities we talked about, you'll get edema in the gator area down by the ankles. So this, these, this is the sequelae uh, of this condition. Let's see what else we got here because of the physical, because of the physical, uh, physically expanding hardened ventricles okay I see where we're going so the myocardial leaflets will now become pulled apart they can't seal on the annulus very good so now you're going to get something called a regurgitation murmur so blood is going to regurgitate back through the AV valves especially the left one here is the main one because of the size of the heart and you can often auscultate this uh, regurgitation and it's called the regurgitation murmur. It's significant, or the regurgitation significantly increases the backup of the blood into the lungs. So now we're worsening that whole train of lung uh, pulmonary edema and hypertension, and it affects the right. That train just gets worse by once the uh, valves become incompetent. So clinical symptoms, the most common symptoms are low cardiac output. So the patient will feel tired, lightheaded, dizzy. He'll get exertional dyspnea. He gets out of breath by walking up the stairs. He might start become cyanotic. His lips might start getting a little blue in color. And so low cardiac output, a common condition. Pulmonary congestion, we just talked about that. Dyspnea, orthopnea. Definitely a bored one right here. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. What the heck is that? That paroxysmal is an attack so the patient's sleeping at night and he'll get woken up. Uh, he can't breathe at night. That's a key sign of pulmonary congestion. And you know, one of the common symptoms of this disorder. And then the previously mentioned uh, right heart failure backup symptoms can come in here as well. The patient will also be cool to the touch. They're not getting a great cardiac output, so their hands and feet will be cold. That's kind of, a lot of times people are nervous and that can uh, cause that as well. Low arterial pressure, so you might be hard to get a pulse in this patient. Oscillatory crackles, uh, we talked about that a little bit. Terrible word. They've been trying to get rid of this since the 50s, but of course in America, USA, uh, they still call it rails. In fact, even in Lily calls it rails. So, uh, oscillatory crackles is the preferred term. No one in Europe uses it. No one, I don't think, in the world uses it except, you know, it's like facet joint, which is another terrible American word instead of the zygapothecial joint or Z joint. But rails, so it'll probably still be on our chiropractic boards, but rails and crackles are AKAs. But that's from pulmonary congestion. Uh, 
percussion dullness at the base of the lungs? Why would there be a percussion dullness? We percussed the lungs last week. Well, that's what fluids, uh, fluids will collect if the patient seated. Remember, this was percussion was done seated. So fluid will collect in the base of the lungs. Uh, you could get a laterally displaced apical impulse because of left ventricular hypertrophy or dilation. It doesn't matter. Uh, either one will displace the apical impulse. Remember, anything larger than the size of a quarter indicates a, a an apical impulse larger than a quarter is pathological, indicates left ventricular hypertrophy or dilation. And if the if the apical impulse is outside of that 10.5 10, 10 centimeters of the mid, that should be the mid sternal line. That's also, also path. I always go with the quarter, though. That's much more accurate. So it shouldn't be bigger than a quarter. Other findings, you might hear a third. An S3 might be heard. Oscillatory mitral valve regurgitation. We're going to talk about murmurs in a little while here. Radiographic appearance, enlarged cardiac silhouette. The whole heart will be, not just the ventricle, but the whole heart will be enlarged. It's the EKG findings of right or left bundle branch block. We talked about that already with tachycardias. You know, why is that important? Why did I spend so much time in that? Because it's usually not these conditions that kill you. It's this darn ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia that kills 40% of those pass away from uh, an arrhythmia, not the actual disease. So. so what can we do? We can't do a lot for this, but we can definitely make sure the patient is on a salt-restricted diet. Uh, diuretics we can't prescribe, but uh, you know, this is more treated, of course, by a cardiologist. But diuretics to reduce water tension, vasodilator therapy to improve tissue oxygenation or perfusion, such as angio, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers or beta blockers uh, can all help the symptoms of this condition. Classic treatment, though, is an implantable cardio con or cardio converter defibrillator if the patient develops an arrhythmia so the the ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fib doesn't kill the patient an arrhythmia medication is a no-no arrhythmia medication not only doesn't work but it may increase well research says it increases the mortality rate so you definitely if your patient is being treated for this you're going to get a history of medications make sure they're not on arrhythmia medications uh, for DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, right? It'll kill them or it could increase the risk of death. Anticoagulation therapy, what the heck, how would that treat DCM? Well, the enlarged atrium ventricles are a breeding ground for thrombus or the process of thrombosis. And sometimes we said thrombus can throw an embolism. You can break a chunk out of the thrombosis process and an embolism can fly if it's in the atria. It's in the arterial side. It can go to your brain, cause a stroke. It's all sorts of things. We talked extensively about that. Uh, ven on the venous side, you have venous stasis going on, right? We got we got swelling down there at the ankles, edema, pair in the gator regions, and that is a breeding ground for venous thrombosis. That can throw an embolism as well, although that'll get stuck in the lungs and cause trouble with the lungs if it doesn't get stuck in the heart. All of these treatments have been shown to improve symptoms and reduce mortality.